Some folks say the great players of the past could never compete against the modern players like Carlson and Hikaru and so forth, but I believe that is nonsense. In fact, the player we're going to look at today, world champion Emmanuel Lasker, I believe would have no problem competing at the highest level this very day. The quality of his play, even more than 100 years ago, is astonishing. He would have no problem playing these days. This game was a game from the St. Petersburg International Tournament, a very famous tournament. His opponent, none other than Jose Raul Capablanca. Lasker would have been in his mid-40s, uh, Capablanca in his mid-20s. Lasker had the white pieces, Capablanca had black. Let's jump right in. E4, E5, knight F3, knight C6, bishop B5. The Spanish, very common opening today. A6, and bishop takes C6, the exchange variation. And you could play an opening like this today. You're not going to get a theoretical advantage with it, but you don't get a theoretical advantage with anything pretty much these days, and you get a very playable position. Dc6, d4, and here he plays for the exchange of queens. Uh, queen d4, taking it straight into the endgame. Now, you, you think when you're playing someone like Capablanca, who by this time was already established as an elite master of the endgame, you might not uh, want to go into an endgame with him. But Lasker was not worried at all about doing this, so the queens come off the board. Knight takes d4. And here we have the distinguishing qualities of an exchange Spanish. Black has the two bishops. White has the healthier pawn structure in a four versus three majority on the king side. That was true then, and it's true now. Nothing has changed in that regard. Those are the defining qualities of this position. Now, the most popular idea these days is to play bishop d7 and castle long. Capablanca instead plays bishop to d6. This move is not as popular, but it's still playable today. Knight to c3 from Lasker, knight e7. And this knight e7 move prepares a potential f5 push, opening the position for the bishops. Also, black can play f6 and play that knight to g6 to try to restrain this e5 square. Lasker castles. And here, Capablanca could have played bishop d7 with long castling. That might have been the best choice, but he castles short. Still a reasonable move. And we talked about how in this position, white has this healthy kingside pawn majority. And what do you do with the pawn majority? You push it. F4. Lasker plays simple, clear chess, advancing his pawn majority in the center. Rook to e8 is played. Something like bishop c5, pinning the knight after bishop e3 doesn't do anything at all. White's fine. So rook to e8 to try to slow down this advancing pawn majority. Knight to b3. Helps keep c5 under control, so now the bishop can't go to c5 with check. And here, f6. So what Capablanca wants to do, he wants to play the knight to g6. And if f5 is played, jump into e5 with the knight. Then play b6, bishop b7, and c5, so that the bishop is powerful on this diagonal. But Lasker's next move cuts across this entire idea. He plays the move f Five. Now the knight cannot get into the g6 square. Now, a lot of people at the time were critical of this move. For one thing, his majority is now crippled a little bit. He can't advance this pawn to e5 easily, so it's harder for him to advance his majority, and he has a backwards pawn on e4. But what Lasker knows, this deeper strategic concept, is that this knight is aiming right for this e6 square, and playing f5 gets that square. B6, Capablanca continues his plan of playing bishop b7 and c5. And here, bishop f4. Again, simple chess. Black has the bishop pair, so he seeks to trade off one of those bishops and remove the two bishop advantage. The best move from black here is probably uh, bishop takes f4, rook f4, then c5, playing bishop to b7 with the equal but unbalanced position. Uh, but instead, he goes ahead and plays bishop to b7. The thinking is, well, white can take my bishop, but if he does so, he'll heal my pawn structure. And Lasker does take it, and while it does fix that pawn structure, it's no longer a crippled majority. Uh, he creates a target on d6 that Lasker can go after with his rooks on the d-file, but first things first, knight to d4. That f5 square 
got that e6, uh, the f5 move, got that e6 square. Now the knight moves to d4, preparing to hop right into that square. Um, rook a to d8 was played by Capablanca with the hope, I think, of playing d5 at some point. But Kasparov, in his analysis of this game, suggests bishop c8, just admitting the mistake and keeping that knight from jumping into e6, where he, it can be captured by uh, the bishop. After rook a to d8, the knight hops in to e6, hitting the rook, so the rook moves to d7. Rook a to d1, putting pressure on the backward d6 pawn. Knight to c8, defending the pawn, a passive move. Now rook to f2. You have a backwards pawn, so you double rooks on it to put pressure on d6. b5, an attempt to maybe later dislodge that knight on c3 with b4. Rook f to d2, doubling on the file. Now rook d to e7. And again, threatening b4. So now Lasker plays a strong move, b4 himself. So now black will not be able to advance to b4 and dislodge the knight on c3. King to f7, centralizing the king, a3. Now, the best move here, and modern computers confirm this, is probably just to go ahead and take on e6, give up the exchange for a pawn, and try to play on uh, from this position. Uh, but instead, Capablanca plays the move bishop to a8, with the idea of shifting this rook over to a7 and opening the a file with a5. Um, again, Kasparov made the point that really white is the only one who'll be able to exploit that A-file, so that's probably not the best strategic decision. Uh, but a modern chess player would def could definitely make this decision for black. King to F2, centralizing the king, rook to A7, G4 gaining space and preparing a potential G5 pawn break. H6 stops that for the moment. Rook to D3, so that this uh, rook can maybe go to G3 to support the push to G5. A5 opening the A file, as we discussed. H4, preparing the G5 break. AB4, AB4. And I guess it was at this point Capablanca realized he, there was really nothing to do on the A file. If he plays rook to A3, for example, then Lasker would just continue with his G5 push. And if uh, black took twice after rook to G1, he's in big trouble with the rook uh, threatening G5 and then threatening G7. So instead, Capablanca retreats back to E7. I think he realizes at this point that the exchange sack was probably his only real hope. Um, G5 was playable here, but uh, King F3 is played by Lasker. He wants to play some preparatory moves before his final breakthrough. Rook to G8. Capablanca has to sort of sit and wait. He has no play. King to F4. Now G6. Um, if G5, then just King to F3. And if he takes on H4, Rook H1, threatening Rook H4, Rook H6. So that's no problem. Uh, so g6 is played instead. Rook to g3. Now g5 check, but he just retreats the rook. And again, if gh4, rook h3, threatening rook h4, and then attacking h6. So instead, knight to b6 is played by Capablanca. He wants to jump into c4, then maybe e5, or he would deliver check. But Lasker's play is a little quick for that. hg5, hg5, and now rook to h3, threatening to take advantage of the open h file. The rook goes to d7 to defend d6. Uh, Laster could have taken on d6, but that wouldn't have been any better than the game. He's just focusing on getting those rooks active. He's not worried about the d6 pawn at the moment. But now Capablanca defends d6. King to g3, uh, moving away from the aim of this bishop or any potential checks on e5. Just a precautionary move. Uh, rook h7 check also works. King to g3. King to e8, rook d to h1, and now he's established dominance over the open h file. Bishop to b7 from Capablanca, again, just moving pieces. And now it's time for a breakthrough. And the move Lasker plays here, a brilliant move, is also the top choice of modern computers. He plays the move e5. Upon sacrifice, opening up the e4 square for his knight, and when the knight lands on that square, black's position is in very big trouble. First, Capablanca, of course, takes the pawn, but now knight to e4. This knight is an absolute monster. Of course, he's threatening knight to f6 check, sort of forking everything. So Capablanca has to deal with that. He plays the move knight to d5 to defend uh, the f6 pawn and putting some pressure on b4 maybe for later. But here, knight 6 to c5 is played by La Lasker, and that's a real tough uh, move. If Capablanca, say, plays rook to c7 to avoid the direct attack and defend the bishop. Just knight takes bishop. Rook takes knight. 
knight to d6 check forks the king and the rook. Uh, so instead, he decides to just give up the rook with bishop to c8 and leave his uh, position, leave himself in a little bit better position than he would have been in otherwise. Knight takes d7, bishop takes d7, and again, this knight cannot take on b4 because of knight to f6 check. Rook to h7, penetrating on the seventh rank. Rook to f8, and now Capablanca opened the a-file, but Lasker takes advantage of it with rook to a1, threatening rook to a8 check. Capablanca is in big trouble. After king to d8, rook to a8 check, bishop to c8, and knight to c5. And up in exchange, and with his position uh, collapsing, Capablanca resigned. And the main reason is this. If after knight to b6, uh, just rook to b8, and if the knight goes to d7, he can just play rook to d7 check. The bishop can't take the rook. The king can't take the rook because it's protected by the knight at c5. King eight, rook c8 would be mate. Uh, really a, a beautiful game from Lasker. Clear, simple, strategic themes. And I can assure you that his play, his quality of play, would be very successful today as well. I hope you enjoyed the game. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.